uh, Mr. A.J. Guillen. Uh, uh, let me tell you a little bit about him before he gives his talk. He's a member of Kronos, which is the group that oversees the, the OpenCL language in the, in the open community, uh, and has actively contributed to the OpenCL C++ kernel language, which has provisionally been released as part of the OpenCL 2.1 standard. He's an alumni from U of T, where he, where he did honors Bachelor of Science with a strong focus on mathematics, operating system design, and computer science theory. His passions include big, fast computers and the theory that powers them. Um, yeah, we're not on the hardware side. I'm totally on the math side. Yeah. <laughs> and he's also a master swimmer, water polo player, and enjoys rock climbing when time for that's aging. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to get out of the mold of the stereotypical programmer from Jurassic Park. That's my incentive. So I try to do a lot of swimming. And I can't bring electronics with me when I swim. So, so thanks for the introduction. Um, now that this is a recorded talk, I'll start with the disclaimer. So this particular presentation, terms, subsidiaries, blah, 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 whatever, I don't, I'm not aware. Um, so that everything that I'm presenting you is my own personal view. It's not reflective of Kronos, anything like that. Um, any technical mistake or bad joke is entirely my fault. Um, so now that we have that out of the way, we can actually talk about what I want to talk about. So Kronos is an interesting organization. I've certainly heard of standards bodies such as um, the ISO. I've heard of places like, um, what is it, uh, W3C. Um, Kronos is another organization which is most known for OpenGL. And recently it's been making the rounds in the news for the creation of Vulkan, which is a reboot of OpenGL for, for multi-threading and for um, high-performance graphics on modern devices. And I'm not sure, not sure the entirely of the data, I think the last refresh of OpenGL um, was quite some time past. So Kronos is an organization that brings together a number of the hardware companies and software vendors other, under this existing <laughs> IP framework uh, so that they can collaborate. And one of the things that was mentioned at uh, GDC, which is where a lot of these announcements uh, happened with OpenCL 2.1 and with Vulkan, uh, is one of the few places, as Kronos's point of view is, that this could have happened, that we can come together and say, what's the future of energy computing? Because the players are already in place. Um, I know that Altera joined um, some time ago and came with the look at OpenCL as a method of doing um, FPGA programming models. So Xilinx and Altera both have OpenCL implementations now. And it's a really interesting place where um, hardware vendors and software professionals come together to determine what the next generation of software should be and through these specifications that developers can uh, just go ahead and start to use. I don't know if you're going to talk about it, but it's, in some sense that Vulkan is competitive with OpenCL, is, is that correct? Or? No, um, Vulkan is specifically on the graphics side. Open, it does provide some compute shader capabilities, just like OpenGL does, has compute, and OpenGL and Master Plan has compute There's shaders. There's no general purpose aspect to, to um, Vulkan, the majority of the specification is still under development, and hence under um, NDA. But I, I will say that if you look at it, just conceptually, Kronos already has OpenCL. They have something that does graphics. It's very likely that over time they're going to converge in, in some nice way. Um, and unfortunately, that's the only answer I can do for that at this time. Um, one of the things with OpenCL is that people use it as a back end for parallel language design. So if you're doing a domain specific language, so maybe not my domain specific language is photography. Maybe my domain specific language is finance. Maybe my domain specific language is um, molecular dynamics. One of the things that people like to use OpenCL for is to target it on the back end so that then you can take it and run it on many different devices. Uh, you can run it on your FPGA, you can run your CPU, you can run your GPU, your ZMFI, other accelerators. There are challenges to that, and this particular focus of uh, this talk has uh, kind of had some back and forth between Paul Chow and myself in terms of what to talk about. Um, mostly it's going to be talking about, uh, this particular talk is going to be talking about the standard itself, how it comes about and the relevance uh, to, to other things that FPGAs are a little bit behind uh, because they're on OpenCL 1.0 and now there's 2.1 that's out in a while. So in terms of OpenCL, it is a little bit tricky from reading the specification how to think about what OpenCL is about, what it does, and what problem it solves. 
And this is no different than if you read the C++ spec or if you read the HTML specification. Without a lot of motivation, it doesn't entirely make sense. So I want to put forward a little bit in terms of what it's about, because this will help you understand a little bit of the context. So OpenCL, my personal view of it, is that it's really a standardized set of abstractions. Okay? The abstractions are designed to map efficiently to real hardware. And this is challenging because there are so many different hardware devices out there. There are so many different um, things that software developers want to do that the mapping can change quite a bit. And this is how really to think of OpenCL is as just this collection of abstractions and then someone like Altera or Xilinx, Intel, AMD will create an implementation that takes those abstractions and tries to map it to physical hardware as best they can. And over time, the versions change because the abstractions change and we find better ways to do things. So I want to go over a little bit in terms of how the standard is structured. Um, this is important when we talk about, um, it, it's important to understand what features are required and not required from, from hardware vendors when we do implementations. So the open sales standard itself is composed of core features, core optional features, KHR extensions, and vendor extensions. Okay. And this is going to make sense maybe in a couple slides why right, I'm mentioning this. So the core specification is everything that every conformant implementation must support. Uh, for example, addition. If you cannot add A plus B, you have no hope of ever supporting OpenCL. It's, it's game over for you, and I, I don't know if there's such hardware that can't do that, but um, you, know, you have to support everything in the core specification. There is also core optional. These are things that could be supported. Uh, double is a core optional. Um, image support is core optional. I'm not aware if Altera or Xilinx's implementation support images or not. Um, but the reason that the uh, the reason we have these core optionals is we say that well, a lot of hardware uh, could do this, but it's not required. You're not going to be prevented from shipping an implementation because you don't have double support or something like this. There's the KHR extensions, which are official amendments to the specification. So extensions is basically an amendment. It's not just a module. It's actually saying we are going to strike out this word over here and the, we're changing the specification. KHR extensions are ones that Kronos has approved and multiple vendors agreed to support them. Okay? Um, vendor extensions are extensions for a particular vendor. So I believe Altera has, I think it's called the channel extension. That's specific to Altera. Um, and I'm not familiar with Xilinx's implementation. If Xilinx, for example, were to have also a channel extension, they may come together and make a KHR extension later that then says, okay, well, we both agree that this is the way that FPGAs should, should work when we're doing data flow type stuff. And so that, for that reason, we make it into a KHR extension and then maybe it'll go to core optional one core. So I wanted to convey, especially because the University of Toronto is a Kronos member, is an academic Kronos member, um, some of you may participate and part of the process, and uh, wanted to provide a little bit of background on what that process is like and what it means. I mean, you will see this in press releases where people will say, for instance, Spear V is um, a core feature, so that's what this means. If you say this is now an extension, when you read the press releases and you see the, evolve, the evolving uh, language, you understand what the implications are. And of course, just to make your life very complicated, each specification has a version attached to it. So this time, Altera and Xilinx is on version 1.0. Um, NVIDIA recently was on 1.1. They just announced 1.2 support. Um, Intel and others, uh, Qualcomm, for example, have 1.2 implementations. And 2.0, AMD and Intel both have 2.0 implementation shipped. So we're in this kind of weird situation where you have so many different versions. And that's why I wanted to explain, um, I'm going to explain a little bit of the challenges this presents in terms of if you're writing FPGA code right now for version 1.0, is there anything I can tell you from experience doing this on the GPU side and the accelerator side that maybe can help you structure your code now so that you have a better understanding of how to move forward in the future? So ideally, this is what the life cycle should be. We want to say, okay, uh, Altera has a vendor extension. Maybe they work with Xilinx behind the scenes. They have a KHR extension. And then each version, you're going to progress as you get increasing stability. This is basically how the specification views the world, and so we're going to go through this type of progression. Now, one of the challenges that comes up is that these are abstractions, and abstractions may not be completely, may not have a one-to-one -one mapping with everything hardware can do. So this is a 
somewhat complicated diagram, so let me explain. If we look at the set of everything your hardware can do, okay, there may be things that no OpenCL abstraction supports. On AMD's GPUs, I believe that they have a global data store. I do not believe there's any method even through extensions to access this. Just if you use OpenCL, it's, it's not there. Okay? Um, I may be inaccurate on that, but that's, we'll take that as an example. So if we look at the specification, this, the OpenCL standard is going to expose everything in your hardware that the core standard can do and support it or optional can do. So if you support double, you can support that. Okay? You have to support what's in the core standard. You may have things that your hardware does that's rather special. Okay? So my understanding from FPGA example is FPGAs are designed to be more streaming and to have more data flow capabilities. The OpenCL standard doesn't really have this at this time. So what that allows you to do um, is you can provide vendor extensions like Altair and other Xilinx may to expose extra parts of the hardware. But there's likely always going to be something that your hardware can't do. And this is one of the interesting roles of Kronos is to try to minimize across many vendors, because let's say this is just the, you know, this set is going to look different for every single vendor. We want to minimize what can't be exposed while maintaining efficiency of abstraction mappings to real hardware, etc. So it gets really challenging to decide what feature goes into the standard, because you want it to work well everywhere, you want everyone's hardware to be exposed, you want to provide abstractions that developers will like and have efficient mappings. So you're, the only thing you're not going to support for the OpenCL standard, otherwise you will not be conformant, is, um, is maybe some, some core optional um, things. Otherwise, you have to support it. So this, this diagram changes from OpenCL version, version to version to version, okay? So I'm not aware of the details in terms of why, um, if there's a technical reason why, or it's a non-technical reason why Altera and Xilinx say on 1.0 at this time. There have been changes inside of OpenCL from 1.1 and 1.2. Perhaps it's something that is in the core specification that they can't actually support. I don't really know. But this is just an idea of how the standard is, uh, is structured. So this becomes really an interesting challenge. Uh, from, there's any computer scientist in the room, this is definitely an MP-complete problem. Um, so I wanted to, to illustrate that if you look at the OpenCL specification, it's going to have some, some, set, some subset across all devices of what the hardware can do. If it's outside of this little set, it's unsupported hardware capabilities. So the role of the committee and the role of the discussion within Kronos is to try to make this as large as possible so that everything your device can do is completely exposed by an open standard. It'll work well across the board. And this is a very challenging, um, this is a very challenging discussion to, to have. So for instance, device A has a few things in the set that can't be exposed to OpenCL. Device C, everything it does is exposed. Great. Uh, this may happen in future if hardware vendors decide to make um, specific hardware for the OpenCL standard. Whether they do or not, I don't know. But maybe this is how that will occur. Um, and you may have devices that initially, many of their features aren't supported. And the role of the OpenCL standard is really to make sure that developers are able to provide abstractions. And it's the, it's, I want to say the problem of the implementers to make sure that it works as well as possible on hardware. But there's, there's areas where that um, can fall short, short in practice. And because the versions change, this may change from version to version. So maybe you have amazing 1.0 support, but for 2.0 support, you can't really do it. So I'll give you a concrete example. So for 1.0 support, you have um, quite addressable memory is, a, is an optional feature. It's a KHR extension. Right? You, you may not be able to get the, the byte address of, uh, of some memory. With 2.0 now, we have support for, for share, shared virtual memory. You can actually do reference pointers on devices. This may be something that your hardware just can't do because it doesn't have access to, to how the host you know, works. I don't know the details of how on a PCIe card you're going to get involved with maybe snooping on the cache or doing uh, TLDs or something like that. I understand it works on the CPU. When you start bringing in other add-on devices, FPGAs, I don't know how they're going to do consistency. That being said, the 2.0 standard does provide fallbacks that you reasonably could do um, in different uh, implementations. So in terms of challenges, what I wanted to, to the, the final thought on this diagram that I want to show is that with each version, when you change features, and especially with OpenCL C++, OpenCL C++ has all sorts of nice things. We have exceptions, right? We can grab an exception, we can move it around, we have different threading, 
it becomes challenging even to design the kernel language to, to work well across different hardware. Um, and this is one of the, the major places where Kronos is a, has an important role, is that the, the software and hardware companies can come together to figure out what's the best covering, admitting that we can't get full coverage of what hardware can do. Um, in terms of challenges of OpenCL, um, I, I'm going to show diagrammatically one particular challenge. And that is that it's possible to write programs that are functionally correct and obtain peak performance on particular pieces of hardware. So let's say we have devices A, B, C, and D here. You can write a program that will be functionally correct on device A and will get peak performance and across the board. But there's nothing to say that if I take program A and I say, okay, I'm just going to take this program. So to make this a concrete example for this group, let's say I take an FPGA based kernel for Altera. I'm going to run it on Xilinx now. Will it work? Will it be fast? Well, we don't really know. Um, I haven't seen, I've seen some research literature, but I'm not, I'm not up to date at this point in terms of what's been published in the past uh, eight months or so. Um, in terms of OpenCL is a perform is a standard that allows you to get performance and portability, but it's not necessarily at the same time, and I don't know that we know that at this time. Um, that is something that this is a research project. We have to understand whether or not this is possible. So if you take a program A and you run it on the different devices, maybe it's not functionally correct for device B. It just gives out wrong data now, or it just crashes. Um, an example of this, to be concrete, if you write code on a GPU, because you have the concept of wave fronts, you have locked instruction pointers, uh, and let's say you try to implement a mutex, it's going to work perfectly well on a CPU. It'll loop forever on a GPU. So that's one example of something where you don't really get the, the functional portability even. Um, you may not, you may find that it works, maybe I could take it from one CPU or on another CPU, but it's not as performant. And this is not necessarily a problem with the spec itself per se, so much as that this is the first time anyone's tried to do something like this. Um, we now have to figure out how, what are the best practices? Is there a way to write code that works well? Is there a particular structure? And I will point out that with C programming, this is the same thing. If you write C code for a particular processor and you know everything about how the processor is designed and you take it to another one, you may not get good performance. And this is one of the challenges of the OpenCL standard right now, it is, is how you do this type of, of migration. So if we're in this situation where you write for every single device hand-tuned kernels and code, and by the way, these versions, I mean, it's three-dimensional now because this will change with all the different versions of OpenCL, um, you're fine. but I mean, software developers, uh, don't tell them I said that. I mean, we're lazy people. We don't want to write this much work. Every time we write, if we write just two kernels, the probability of me making a bug is very high. We want to maintain a small code base that just recompiled um, and just works. But it's not entirely clear how to do that. This is an interesting research um, challenge at this time. So similarly, if we take device B, you know, maybe it doesn't work anywhere. If we take program B, device B, it may not work anywhere. But it'll obtain, it'll only work. So I want to interject a little bit of the type of stuff I'm working on. So one of the things, and this is what I spend my time doing, is I'm working on higher level abstractions that I can, that are above the OpenCL abstractions, and they can efficiently map. If we have mappings that are specific to device, or we have methods of probing to determine what those mappings should be. And then by using these higher level abstractions, a little bit higher than OpenCL, you do get this. Um, if you think about it, I mean, just conceptually, we have OpenCLC code. Is there a way to transform the C code to be performant and functionally correct across the board? Well, th there's only so many ways to write a particular algorithm um, that is functionally correct and performant, and it's a matter of transforming now your code. Okay, can I ask you a question? Sure. In the work in which you're creating high-level abstractions, how do you convince yourself you're doing good stuff? Like, what real examples do you use it on to, to convince yourself it's worthwhile? Well, I think most of my work on this is on the, I will say is on pencil and paper to understand mathematical abstractions in terms of what I attempt to do is I attempt to build parameterized models where maybe there's some alpha here that's a fudge factor for the effect of, say, latency height or something like that. And then I would run it on devices and obtain that number, but I parameterize the model, if that makes sense. That's how I convince myself. In terms of real hardware, that's where things 
so they're like micro benchmarks that t test the the actual performance at the end of some some very specific thing uh, that you're working with at the higher level of abstraction. Yeah, I have a higher level abstraction that has fudge factors for this is so I mean I have a mathematical representation of say the execution model with a fudge factor for this is how latency hiding or something like this will take will affect it. Um, and then I try to determine those parameters. But this is an open this is what I'm working on, not what I've solved. So it is very, very challenging. Which but to be clear, are you yeah. actually running something to test that or it's all theory? Right now it's mostly theory and then we run benchmarks. But it's confident theory. I'm confident. Well, so it's not theory if you run the benchmarks. Right. So you actually run the benchmarks. I have run benchmarks previously, but not for writing a micro benchmark and getting it right. It's much more challenging than parameterized modeling. The, the, the main area I'm looking at is what are the high level abstractions at all. Mm -hmm. And then figure out the mappings and then we try to build hardware and see where we are. So this is a preview of what I'm working on, not what well, I can't come and show you results unless this would be something. This is the future. Does that make sense? I just want, yeah, and I just want to point out Henry wrote uh, a paper four years ago uh, on micro benchmarking of uh, NVIDIA GP, GPUs. I think I read that one. And that was done with most of us? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and so he, he actually helps a student of mine who's trying to do something similar on mobile GP, GPUs. And right. it's not, not easy to do, actually. If you get the mobile GP, GPU one, send it to me. We're saying <laughs> that's a very interesting problem. Yeah. Uh, my point of view is not, so I'll, I'll take a minute, I mean, to just, to just kind of do like a sidebar here. I feel that writing micro benchmarks may not give me the information I need. It's not the, it's not the architecture per se I want to understand, it's the mappings, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to do is have mappings that I'm confident will work well across open sale versions, and I think it'll work well across devices, and then build the, Micro benchmarks to determine those parameters is the view I've taken. But that being said, those are influenced by all the papers and how the architecture actually works. If I have no notion of latency hiding, you know, which is not in the spec, you're not going to find that in the execution model. The, the new models are going to work well. Um, does that answer? Yes. It's, it's very challenging. It, it just it makes me want to ask. Uh, it seems like you should also. Uh, be dealing with people who are trying to develop real applications and see how the human responds to the abstraction. Because the other end of the abstraction is a human being trying to explain to the computer how yes. to compute something. So, so you need other humans yep. as your test vehicle. Yep. Do you have any of those? I have other humans, other than consulting that I've worked with, with clients who say, well, this is difficult, can it be better? Well, we'd love to try this sort of thing. Um, as well as uh, other people, HPC community who are interested in just trying things. Um, I also like to think of myself as a human who wants things to be higher level abstraction because I don't want to write all this code. So my initial litmus test is always myself, and then we'll see where things go. But this is, uh, I want to make the one point about the open sale standard is that it's, it's not an inherent flaw this, that this doesn't exist. It's, it's a research question that is, we're able to ask only because we have something that we don't have to write a compiler and target everything, and then someone's going to say, oh, but your compiler isn't that good. So it's a very interesting question for me is how do you, is there already an existing subset of OpenCLC and C++ that is portable? If there isn't, can we fix the spec? What do we do? It, this is a very challenging research problem. We'd be happy to have a discussion over pizza sponsored by uh, Huawei. Or Huawei. 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 So that, that's the commercial break. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Can I just ask really quickly, what kinds of abstractions are you looking at? What, what are some of the abstractions you've, you've played with in this model? So, I don't want to get into the into detail. I think that might be better for me to talk about during pizza, if that's all right, because I want to get through the presentation and we'll go off record. <laughs> it's very scary for me to be recorded right now. So okay. come back to me for pizza and we'll, we'll have a whiteboard kind of discussion. Um, the other thing that I've been when working on is that if you have these high-level abstractions, and let's say that my abstractions work, you know, that's a big claim in itself. Let's say that it works. And I say, okay, well, you write stuff hey, this way, um, and then I'm going to map it efficiently to an FPGA, CPU, GPU, Xeon Phi, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then we can actually build compute cluster technology off of this. We can then take this thing, out of, you know, whatever shape or form that is, and then say, okay, well, I'm going to take your job and run it for 100 cycles over here. I'm going to then take it up and move it over there, and move it over here. 
and so on. So this is long term where I'm going. It's taking this type of idea and putting it into a compute cluster where we can have different nodes devices. And cloud's the in-term these days, so let's call it cloud. Okay. And this is where I, I know that uh, Paul's been working on this research area. Well, this is my main. Uh, I'm on the other side, actually. It's really interesting when we kind of got together and connected for discussions is that I've been working on this from the software standpoint. And it was very <coughs> illuminating for me to, to speak with a computer engineer who's working at it from the other standpoint and then see where we kind of work out. Um, some of my, my talks, I'll show a diagram of, you know, a complicated UML software diagram. And underneath, the software guys say, you know, processor, right? And it's really interesting to see the other side. We see transistors in the bug we see. Right. So it's, it's really kind of interesting to see from the perspective of even creating something like the open sales standard, we have to come together and say, there's a, there's a processor there? You know, I, I just want this thing to work this way. What, what do you mean I don't have function pointers? I right. don't have function pointers in open sales, that's important. Um, so that's a quick aside. Um, I want to talk briefly about the type of challenges you may face migrating from open CL 1.0. Um, if Altair or Xilinx ship future OpenCL versions from the experience of what, what we encountered um, from GPU software, you're going to find a few issues are going to come up. Um, number one issue is basically a replay of this diagram. Is it even on the same device with different versions of OpenCL, they've changed the compiler, they now take advantage of this feature, things change. So you may actually have to write something like this but then now it's it's version based, so the 1.0 version, the 1.0 version, the 1.2 version, the 2.0 version. It's very complicated. You may have to. In practice, you don't always have to. In reality, with GPU software, you generally don't, unless you get tempted to use a nice feature. And generally, there's nice enough features in the open sale versions that you get very tempted, right? So I mean, Atomics have changed um, device to you know from version to version. And, and so on, and you know, if you want double support and stuff like this, you're going to change how you want to do things anyways because you want to use the latest and latest um, features. So that's one of the biggest migration challenges I'll say. Um, once you understand the OpenCL programming model, moving from version to version to version isn't actually that bad. Um, you do have to be aware of fine print in terms of the behavior can change, and really the way to think of the OpenCL standard is really um, self-contained standards that you really want to write your code for 1.0 and then don't try to use too much. Um, reusing code can lead to, to difficult issues. Uh, we can talk about that over pizza, but um, the main migration challenge without, I, mean, I haven't used the Ontario Science implementation before, but from the GPU side, um, usually what happens is there's new things in the kernel language. So for example, we introduce um, three component vectors. If you want to use three component vectors, and they're actually four component but if you want to use three component vectors, then that's something that was no longer compatible with 1.0. So you have to find ways to, to deal with that fact. Um, ultimately, moving, I mean, if you want to use, for instance, C++, you have to use 2.1, et cetera. Um, usually, the, the incompatibilities are on the host side. So for instance, with 1.0, we had a CL set command queue properties. Um, that's gone now. Um, I doubt that um, they would have done what you think they would have done with previous OpenCL versions. Um, and there are, each, each version of the software has a set of deprecations and so on. Um, but most of the challenge you're going to have, if you, if you take something and write an FTGA code now, it's wonderful, and let's say tomorrow um, there's, a, there's a new FPGA vendor on the block called Yam Yow Apps or whatever it is, and they suddenly have 2.0 implementation, um, most of your kernel code will be okay. Um, the host code will have to be rewritten, and um, if you actually want to squeeze every ounce of performance, you probably will have to rewrite from scratch. Um, only because OpenCL 2.0 adds things like pipes, you add new memory models, etc. And if you want top performance, you generally have to use the new, the new stuff. Um, so OpenCL 2.1 was just announced on March 3rd at uh, GDC. Um, there's only one slide on this. What happened here, the main things to look at is Sphere V. is now a core feature of OpenCL 2.1. So Sphere V is a, um, an IR. Um, it's the Kronos IR now that is being shipped. The previous versions of Sphere were based on LLVM. Sphere V is now completely self-contained. And the idea is that you can target now the Sphere V IR and then you can go from there to, to OpenCL um, 2.1 or 2.1 code, etc. So this is now um, 
a back-end language, by, uh, back-end IR, and what's also happening is that with OpenCL, the actual host code, um, the OpenCL C++ compiler actually generates your V code, right? So, so what's happening is putting a compiler front end and everything else inside of implementation led to issues. And the main idea of Spear V is it's been designed so that the compilers can be much higher quality, that they are just doing some form of transformation, single pass, register allocation, stuff like that's still happening inside of um, underneath the hood. But the idea is that the front end language, which I don't know anyone has ever written one that's completely correct ever, um, is now somewhere else so that your device, your actual implementation doesn't have to be revised or, or upgraded. Oh, that's a great thing. I, yeah. I, I've been confused for years about the fact that the drivers are compilers. Uh, and it's still a compiler, I guess, mm -hmm. but now a lower level. <coughs> so I can give you the phrase, I'm not, I have, unfortunately, a limited background in compiler design. What they did is they split the compiler in half to admit um, Spear V is a, is a IR that's been designed specifically to be in between the high level language and the low level kind of optimization process. And one of the ideas here is, I mean, I'll make up my own example. Imagine if you ship in this in a car. Do you really want to have the update download of your C++ front end, right? You don't really want to have that. And C++ is going to be a difficult front end to get right. I mean, OpenCLC took some time to get get right, and now we have OpenCLC++, um, which is going to be much more complicated. So this, it is completely decoupled now. The language has, the Spear V has been designed to make the compilers, to make the implementations more stable. I wouldn't be surprised if someone with a better background in compiler theory than I am can prove that those transformations are correct now. So we know their implementation is good. Um, and then you just rely upon the front end. As a software developer, what I like is that this is, I say this inaccurately as almost like a portable assembly language. So I talked about wanting high-level abstractions. My high-level abstractions now can be a new language concept. And I don't have to target OpenCLC or OpenCLC++. I can just target Spear. So this also is shared with Vulkan. So Spear V is also shared with the graphics guys. So we're now, that's why it's becoming the Kronos IR, because we actually have this kind of unified back-end uh, IR that we're using. And um, OpenCLC also target this. And you can build your own high-level languages, which, as we mentioned, people are doing anyways. Most people are using OpenCL, aren't using OpenCL, OpenCL. They're building domain-specific languages. So I have a few points that I can give on, you know, I've been thinking on, this is where I personally want to see the OpenCL specification go. And one of the things I'd really like to see inside of OpenCL is increasingly autonomous devices. So what I'd like to see is that I would like to be able to do device-to-device -device communications. Uh, it's motivated by, we talked already about my idea that I want to use OpenCL. It's a back-end computing platform for computer clusters. So obviously I'm going to propose things that make that nicer for me. So right now with OpenCL, you really have the, the host that kind of does everything, and then you have devices that um, don't really have much potential to do much other than report back to right? Now with OpenCL2, we added pipes, and we added um, kernel side and queues so that the device can start to manage itself. I'd like to see that carry forward absurdly to the point where maybe we can even do um, uh, resource balancing or load balancing or something on a uh, compute cluster. So I'm not suggesting that we suddenly put MPI in here or something like that. What I'd like to see is that we have just the facility to, to have high-level communication mechanisms where I can say, well, I've created some more work and I don't really want this device to do it. Maybe someone else can take it. Just kind of split it so it's one of the things I'd like to see is high-level communication primitives and device-to-device -device interaction. Okay? Uh, another thing that I would like to see um, is improved interaction between the host and device boundary. Okay? So what that means is that really the device does its own thing. If you want to prevent the, de if you want to get a message back from the device to the host that's running it, because let's say you divide it by zero, you want a signal, or you want a signal in NAND, something like that, the facilities for that don't really exist in the OpenCL standard right now. The device and the host are really separate, and there's a really thick boundary between the two. Uh, with OpenCL C++, I would love to see if I throw an exception from some work item from somewhere that it can propagate back up 
um, to the host. Now, OpenCLC++ I'll note does not support exceptions at this time. Um, but that's where I would, I would really like to see this type of um, smaller boundary, or at least permeable boundary, where I can send a message to the um, devices that, you know, here's some configuration information and send it back. In terms of even load bouncing, I mean, we've seen high-level primitives like this where people, um, you actually want to do load bouncing on the device itself, you know, the, the high-level things that we have um, with work groups and so on. They have a very specific type of load bouncing, but those can be sensitive to data skews at runtime. So people try to build higher level load balancing type things, um, which requires a lot of hardware knowledge, which would be nice to just have an open source standard. Um, one of the things that is a suggestion from, from people with more of a background with FPGA research um, is this notion of doing high level data flow programming. So one of the places I would like to see the open sales standard go is the ability, and this also correlates with my idea of doing few clusters, that I want to see the ability to, to take some stream of data and do operations and, and pieces as it's flowing through the actual processors. Uh, right now with the kernel execution model, um, you may be able to do that depending on the implementation. I know that Altera has their channel extensions, which attempt to do something very similar. Uh, but at a high level, I'd really like to see um, doing data flow things. And more than data flow, I mean, OpenCL is a compute language. I would love to see OpenCL as a block I.O. capability thing where I'm saying, well, I actually want to get some data off of a store somewhere. And this store may be a block device, a luster file system, some sort of infinite vanity type thing. Um, I would like to see that personally only in terms of, you know, right now your data has to come from memory. It's on the device, right? I would love to see data coming from a sensor you think of a camera, there's no reason I can't have the data coming in from there or something else. So at a high level, this is where I would love to see the OpenCL specification go. Having OpenCL C++ is something that a year ago I would have said as a vision. So this is amazing to me that we have that now because we have the high level distractions and we can start making some of these things happen. Um, but some of these things require hardware support and understanding of, just like we did with the extracting OpenCL's compute language, is it even the role of OpenCL to be an IO language? I don't know. Um, finally, the last thing I would really like to see from OpenCL is enhancements for fault tolerance. Right? So it'd be very nice if we can get a little bit more information from those devices in terms of how they feel. Are you sick? You know, are they to replace you? Have you had a bit of error recently? Um, something like that would be very nice to just have directly exposed because as a software developer, especially if something, I mean, I don't want to deal with it. If it's becoming flaky, I don't know if hardware knows whether or not it's acting flaky. But if it does, it'd be nice to tell me so that I can just avoid it at a higher level software model from now on and just not use it. Um, that's all I care. I don't really want to take, you know, roll the dice. I mean, will this thing keep working? I don't know. Uh, with OpenCL, there's, no, there's this notion that it just, everything's okay. Everything's okay. Everything's okay. I'd like to see us admit that maybe it's not. Um, and so it would be very interesting to see what we can do in terms of building these horrible models. Um, this, is, uh, this is it. I hope that this is useful. The reason the, the FPGA vision part, I think a lot of this is relevant to the FPGAs in terms of, um, you know, doing things like FPGA-based clouds is something that people are starting to talk about. I know that Paul's been talking about that. Um, doing things like uh, programming models is high level things I think has a lot of, of interest. So if you have questions, um, feel free. Great. And uh, my email address here if you want to, to copy down or ensure it's comfortable in some other way as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Questions, comments, suggestions? Yeah. What are the general timeframes for specification changes to OpenCL? So I can look at past history, I can't talk about the future. Um, I believe the cadence has been 18 months previously. I don't know what we're going to hit or not. Uh, but there is, uh, I believe it's in, is it 18 months? Might be less than that. But it is known. I have a slide. If you email me, I can actually tell you what previously has been the cadence. But it's, it's a little over, I think it's like 18 months. Yeah. Uh, can you another example <clears throat> of, you kind of said early, early in the slide about how some open sale programs just won't functionally work it's on their device. Yes. How can you have a case, and you said it's not because the spec's wrong, and it's not because the implementation's wrong. If, you, if I write core OpenCL 1.0 code, yep. and I run it, and that's all legit, 
and I run it on two devices that have correct implementations yep. and they can functionally not work, how can that not be because either the implementation's wrong or something that specs wrong? Well, I shouldn't say it's, the implementation is devastatingly flexible. Uh, the, the standard is devastatingly flexible. That's the issue. And what you see now, the, the issue I mentioned is on GPUs and this concept of wave fronts, somewhat like SIMD lanes that the instruction pointer is locked, right? So if you have one, you're waiting for one element of the SIMD lane, which is a work item to say, I have the mutex, and the other one say, I'm just going to loop forever. I actually crash anything that doesn't have forward progress. Um, what happened, and I can point to this historically, is that this is the, you know, the work group model so I should say that to answer your question, you wrote code that was wrong. It was incorrect, but it seemed like it was going to be okay. And then what happens is we say, uh-oh, this is something people want to do. This is a problem with the spec. The hardware actually works this way. And then what happens is we create subgroups. So now with 2.0, we introduce subgroups, and they are in 2.1 as well, that just reflect the fact, well, our execution model isn't quite right. So that's what I want to say is normally when you write performance stuff, you're taking into account how the hardware kind of works anyways. And it's that the, the specification didn't handcuff you enough. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? It's usually an error of kind of omission, right? <laughs> is that the actual hardware is we don't want to expose how the hardware really works. Um, just because now it becomes like a CPU standard and a GPU standard. And you get like these tomes of specific things, which is where we were. Um, but that being said, you know, this is the first time something else is being done and we inevitably make mistakes, but we correct them. So, so. Uh, so you raised a really good point earlier about sort of the tension between trying to make the specification as broad as possible but still enable heterogeneous hardware. Right. Um, as you think about things like exception handling and, um, you know, job management on board and so on, do you see there's a risk there that you kind of handcuff the hardware to be either an x86 or a Xeon Phi type device and make it almost, well, not, I won't say impossible, very difficult to implement something else? Yeah. I don't because I don't make hardware. So, <laughs> so my rule is to say this is what I wish I had and someone will come along and say you can't have that or as has happened to me as well, you don't want that. And here are the reasons. Um, this is why people participate within Chronos as members is that if you have hardware that you want to be able to be compatible with the open sales standard, you can come in and have these discussions. Um, and there are features that I don't think I can mention that are specific because this hardware can do this, and it's not exposed, this hardware can't do this, so we're going to loosen. Um, so this does happen, and this is why it's being done within the, um, within the working group. Yeah, I, just, I think there's going to have to be interesting discussions there because Intel is going to say, oh, those features are easy. We already have those. And Altera is going to no go, comment, what does no that comment, even no mean? Comment, no, comment, no comment. That's enough comment. No Thanks. comment. No comment. No comment. <laughs> no comment. Okay. Uh, do you have any other questions? Yeah. So, so you, I was just wondering uh, when, for example, Altera had NCL, it was a feature for Altera, but like an advantage for them to have this. Yeah. Now that Salix has it, and I'm just wondering if there is any, what's the incentive for the vendors? to make sure that they have a common abstraction portability across devices because to me, if I have really port real portability, I can use either Stylings or Altera. Yeah. So do you see then uh, any conflict from vendors in getting commoditized? Well, I can't talk about any conflict I've seen, but I can talk about in general, I think that I don't think the AOL network worked out that well or what was it, the MSN or whatever, right? There's usually this notion people want to work well everywhere, right? So open sales is a universal adapter, and developers and companies like having the comfort of universal adapter support. So they say, well, if it, you know, if it works well everywhere, I want to go with the thing that works well everywhere, rather than siloing myself into the product plans and, and so on of a company who says, well, we didn't do well this quarter, so we're going to up our price of our thing because I didn't want to adopt it. Um, the purpose of the open sales standard is to really allow, it's, it's developer friendly in many ways, because you're right, it's not really hardware friendly. It exposes it, but hey, we have this universal adapter. And if you look at it, um, I won't do it for you, but if you look at it, everyone who has an OpenCL implementation also has a pet thing. You know, we support OpenCL and this. Because we're OpenCL and we support this. And from my perspective, the, the next generation of kind of compute 
things can't be done without this universal adapter, if that makes sense. I don't know if that's exactly answering your question. For example, CUDA Media, right? There was a GPC conference, right? And uh, everything was about CUDA, CUDA here, CUDA everywhere, and not so much about OpenCL. Yeah. So, because obviously, if you use OpenCL, it would be the same to use either AMD's CPUs yeah. or NVIDIA CPUs. So, that one just makes me wonder what's the motivation for NVIDIA to support, for example, OpenCL. Okay, so it's not like, I, I think NVIDIA is not like OpenCL and CUDA. It's more like CUDA and OpenCL. Yeah, I mean, that's fair enough. I mean, but to speak to that, I mean, it just was in the news today on portals.org that they shipped 1.2 OpenCL 1.2 support. Right? So I think that if, if you're a company and you're placing your bets on parallel programming, I wouldn't place my bets on any one thing. Right? You want to just kind of spread the room around and see what actually, because we don't have it figured out. Right? The software developers are still kind of stuck. Um, so I think that if we look at things like precedents, like networking, SQL, etc., etc., over time and time again, the, the market prefers a, a standard um, that works well across the board. But it, it may take some time to get there because the standard has to mature. Look at the HTML standard. Look at any of these things, right? I mean, over time, it, it, look at uh, Microsoft Internet Explorer and Firefox. It took a while, but over time, people preferred the interoperating standard. Um, I suspect that from an economic perspective, that's what we'll see happen again as things get figured out. Mm -hmm. Right now, you can support OpenCL, and as I showed you, you're pretty much writing OpenCL for Altera and for Xilinx anyways, mm -hmm. right? So I think, I mean, I don't know much about the, the hardware industry, but I would suspect that having to compete on an equal footing because your device is awesome is probably more of what people want to do anyways. Right? I mean, we saw people unify around you know, these type of things. So that's kind of my perspective. But that being said, I mean, uh, the role of OpenCL is as this type of universal adapter. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 I don't know if I answered your question. It was just kind of like ranting. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, the, I'll ask you. Yeah. yeah, actually, sort of as a follow on to Manuel, I was also at uh, GTC. And it seemed to me that part of the success of CUDA is the libraries. And uh, I'm fairly ignorant of the OpenCL standard. Is there currently or are there plans to standardize a set of libraries for things like, you know, BLAS or? Yeah. Uh, you know, common functions like that. So the, you don't need to worry about your code porting, you just need to worry about composing the right blocks. Yeah, I, I think my personal opinion is that I wouldn't want the most standardized of those, because what if they get it wrong? You know, what if, I mean, that, that's my perspective, because I think that you're going to see these things emerge as, I, mean, I have a company that I, I wouldn't want Chrome doing that. That's what I'm trying to do. Is, you know, if I have performance portability and these things that I'm narrowing down, and I'm going to say, here's an FFP library, here's a, Last library, that's they're eating my lunch as a company, right? I don't think that they want to do that, I don't want them to do that. So I think that that's you know, I don't want to make any comments on, on CUDA or so on. I mean, it's CUDA is a is it solves a very different problem, right? I mean, open sale is a truly heterogeneous thing, and it's opening up the nastiness of what heterogeneity really means, right? I mean, it's so one of the examples that I wanted to give but didn't. Was, I mean, everyone has to give something up to, to be part of the universal adapter. So imagine that we, you know, people have different sci-fi analogies. I'll use the Star Trek one. Imagine that, you know, the United Federation of Planets will have a common language for everyone. Well, you have to give up some concepts. Even in human languages, there's words that have no translation from A to B. So everyone has to give something up in the interest of common communication. And that's, that's what happened. With the open sales tariff. But if you have CUDA or so on, you can expose what hardware does. And in fact, your roadmap can directly map, right? You can make sure that the next CUDA thing is supported by the next processor and so on. I completely get what you're saying there, but I, I'm just asking, you know, might it make sense for the unit of composition to be higher than addition, subtraction, multiplication, and instead make it a matrix operation or a you know, bioinformatics is really hot, you know, like a, a sequence right. alignment or something like that. Um, much like MATLAB, I mean, MATLAB is basically a wrapper around platform-specific optimized blas and stuff right. like that. Yeah, let me say to that that one of the things that comes up is that the role of the open sales standard is to map as well as you can to specific hardware as fast as you can. That's it, leave it alone. Now, the question then above that is, um, 
that in itself is such a big undertaking that that's like a full-time job, right? I mean, most of my work for, for the Kronos is voluntary. I spend a lot of my time working on these types of things. Building a library on top of that and getting it right is going to be so much more commitment. And I mean, I would I can see other members, you know, being a little bit questioning in terms of you know where it's feature creep in terms of what we're doing. Um, I agree that these are things that would be nice to have high level libraries, but I don't think that we know how to do it without these types of performance portability stuff. If you grab um, an OpenCL library that's been optimized for processor X and you run it on a mobile processor, maybe just with this variable performance. So, so I think there's we need to figure out how to address the performance portability issues either as a standards body that's driven by empirical evidence that if we say, so let's say we do an experiment here at U of T and we say, hey, open sales not performance portable. Great, why isn't it? And that could be contributed back to the spec. U of T has a membership. This is how to make it portable. And that could become part of the standard. This is how to fix it up. But we need to, I think that building reusable libraries for open sales would be very challenging. You know, building a library that's... Well, I'm not saying a reusable library. I am suggesting um, a standard API. And so for each of the back ends, you know, you could, there's a there's a business model there to say, okay, we provide open scale yep. compliant libraries per, per for device. the following, you know, standard yeah. operations. So then you can port between devices, not by recompiling your code and having your compiler magically optimize that code to a back end, but by composing blocks that are optimized. Yeah. No, I see what you're saying now. I think that that's not the role of the, I think that that's outside the mandate of what the community should do. Fair. Um, you have a question? Um, so I was wondering if you could contrast uh, Altera's channels, which I'm more familiar with, with uh, pipes that are in uh, 2.0. Uh, so the question high level they sound uh, <laughs> similar. Is that a path to standardization of the channels? <clears throat> so I have an understanding of Altera's implementation. I have not worked with Altera's implementation. My understanding of the channels is that this is uh, it's the ability for a kernel to talk to another kernel. Is that right? Yeah, basically pipeline your output to the input of another kernel. So. Yeah. so for pipes, I don't know what limitations they're going to hit uh, in terms of what they're going to do with that. I think that pipes themselves have, uh, I don't know how to answer that question. Is a pipe essentially the same abstraction? The output of the kernel goes to the input? I, I need to look at the channels. I can look at those abstractions and send you an email if you send me one. And I can tell you, but I need to go look at it. We've had some discussions about that with the like, stuff we've seen. Like channels can talk, not just kernel to kernel, but it can talk to I.O. devices. And pipes right now are just kernel to kernel. That's the distinction. So the, but possibly the kernel to kernel subset could map to a, a pipe one? The, uh, the way they could go around it, I mean, in Amstatics, there are things called built in kernels, which could be, say, an Ethernet fork. That could be a built in kernel. Then you have a pipe between that built in kernel and your defined kernel. That's a way to work around this problem. Yeah, there's no good solution now. I mean, it's an open compute language, not open communication language, right? So that's. Uh, but that's, that's where I would love to see this standard go, is to rely on the access to these controllers. I guess it sounds like some of those discussions are happening right now, though, already. Yeah, and I'll tear it in my link for them. Sorry, this is the dark to see the pics of this is coming. OK. So, but I don't know if you asked the question really about SciCL. SciCL. S -Y, S -Y -CL. Oh, SICL. Yeah. Or yeah. Well, what's, your, what's your question about it? Yeah. I just want to know if that's sort of uh, more or less what you have in mind in terms of a higher level of abstraction on top of OpenCL. Or what is SQL? Yeah. Yeah, SQL is an example of OpenCL middleware, right? And that's ultimately the form that my work will take as well. It's something that uses the OpenCL standard, but maybe makes a, a sits in between, right? Um, no different than something like MPI and closed socket. Um, SQL is a standard that is a type of OpenCL middleware. It's specific to OpenCL 1.2 uh, in its current form. And it's also an example of a single source programming model, right? There, the abstraction, there is no kernel per se. You're writing your code in C++ and it so happens that some of this will offload to the device. Um, I personally don't like that form of abstraction. That's my own personal preference. Some people will. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that we have the same kind of goals in mind, if that makes sense. This is part of the SQL is a Kronos, uh, I believe it's a provisional specification at this point, so you can look it up. 
um, and in SQL is, is a simple source. But it's independent of the actual OpenCL. Um, I don't know how much detail I can talk about the internal structure in terms of what SQL is. It's a Kronos is, has SQL as a provisional specification. And I don't know that I can talk about any of the internal structure or whatever. So then how does your cloud CL uh, differ? In, I know you're saying that it's part of your vision, <coughs> but how, how does cloud CL differ then? So it, it, SQL is the system level middleware. And Cloud CL in general is trying to achieve a similar goal of system level nodes. Yeah. What are the extra extensions you're offering that maybe aren't MPI like specifically? Yeah, I think that when I talked about Cloud CL, I'm talking of in terms of actual distributed computing, you know, sign up type thing where you have you know, a number of workstations in your QNX. Um, Circle is designed for a single node. You know, you're going to have a single thing as a number of accelerators that support 1.2. Um, my vision is very different in terms of providing abstractions that are also device, uh, version agnostic. When I provide you an abstraction, I want it to work on 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, and 2.0. Reasonably well. You know, and they're going to be quite different abstractions. I don't know what shape and form it's going to take out of it. So I see myself as solving a very different problem in terms of, you know, there's, there's always been a category of languages that are for distributed computing and for single node and so on, if that makes sense. Um, the main, you know, what I'm showing is a preview of this is the type of stuff I do, mostly to say this is the type of stuff I do, rather than to talk too much about the details. But, um, it's a very different problem when you say, okay, this is an accelerator, but it might be faulty. You know, we have to deal with, with fault tolerance now in our, our programming models and so on. Uh, and that's where I see myself dealing with different abstractions that can be distributed, can deal with fault tolerance, okay, this accelerator is dead, this node disappeared, the link's faulty, it's intermittent or something like that. It's an entirely different um, problem. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but, and I guess the other side is so one side is that resiliency um, and then sort of my guess, migration of execution. And the other side is the scheduling. Oh, yeah, those are all right. concerns that you're going to have in a distributed context that just simply don't exist on a single accelerator. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's like the shift from one, compute, one processor to multiple processors, and then the shift from multiple processors in a single node to a distributed system, right? Like, mm -hmm. Each one has like an order of magnitude or two increasing complexity. Yeah. Right? So that's why I say like it's going to be a different. Uh, and based on the, the the cadence and where where visions are now, when when would you see such a such a thing? Well, if you think about it, I mean, this is my personal. This is what I'm working on within my own company, right? It's working on these high level abstractions okay. and working on those models. I'll say that. You know, so I can't give internal time frames in terms of what we're working. This is what I'm doing, not what I'm here to sell you today, right? Yeah. Um, what I will say is that if I were to say I have such a thing, it's going to have to work with 1.0. It's going to have to work with what's shipping now. Otherwise, the bar to entry is OpenCL 72.3, right? And I'm going to have to wait to have devices, and all that won't work on my data center. So if you look at something like uh, MPI or distributed computing, they usually took like a really good single node thing like OpenMP or TBB or something like that and then bolted on MPI. Right? That's the kind of work that I see myself doing is what abstractions can I add to the OpenCL standard that are my own abstractions that don't have to be standardized, right? that I then map to what I have and then add in other pieces. So, so that's, yeah. it's an interesting problem. That's, that's what I'm working on. Um, grab a couple more questions. Uh, Henry has one, I think. Yep. This is more of a comment than a question. I sure. It's, it's kind of expressing what Jeff was expressing, but in the opposite direction. So having spent the last few years staring at x86, I appreciated just how difficult it is to get functional portability. I don't even care about performance portability. Um, and it's always felt to me that OpenCL defined the API at too high of a level to achieve functional portability. Um, so, so it was nice to see that spear came out. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I guess the question really is, is, is the future emphasis going to be on making sure Sphere is functionally portable across all the implementation, or is it still going to be the emphasis on the C API? Well, there's Spear and there's Spear V, right? and these are different things. So Spear is, um, Spear was available as an extension with 1.2. I'm thinking about the, the intermediate. And Spear V yeah. is now an IR. Yeah, so I Spear was based on LLVM, yeah. and Spear V is a is a Kronos IR that's completely self-contained. So your question is on it, it, Spear V. Is the emphasis of the future 
specification is going to be trying to push your B, I guess, portability, and where you know where users instead of running OpenCL code, they would run Spear B binaries. Well, that's basically what we see with OpenCL 2.1 provisioning yeah. right now, right? So the push is going to be towards standardizing that and making sure there's functional portability at that level, rather than at the C level. Well, I can't talk about any pushes per se. I can talk about what I want to see. What I want to see is Spear V, you know. I want to see Spear V functionally portable insofar as it can be. But if Spear V has to expose an extension that's specific to this thing or this thing, that kind of breaks. I don't think Spear V is going to solve all the problems so much as make it easier to write um, higher level frameworks. And that's something I, I should note is that the OpenCL 2.1 spec is available provisionally. So what that means is that anyone who's free now to look at it and provide feedback to Chronos in terms of this is what I want it to look like, I don't like this. Um, and then the specification can change drastically based on what people think of it. Yep. Well, how does SpearV support vendor extensions? I don't know the details of SpearV's implementation. Someone here might understand better than I do. My, my view is I put in code, I hit run, and it goes. Uh, the compiler side, the, LA, the IR, all that stuff is beyond my, it's not my area. Um, it's clear from all the side notes you make that you're under an obligation for keeping a lot of things uh, secret. And that's, and I understand that. I just want to ask the meta question. What is the need for secrecy? Is there a competitive advantage to be had by hearing about discussions of hypothetical things? Like what, 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 what's the yeah, need? so the need for secrecy is likely going to come from some legal department of one company or ten or I think Kronos is up to 130 members. I, I, I don't understand the, the need for secrecy for all these things myself. I think that you know, software has become a rather litigious environment in terms of software patents, right? And I think that if we had the same situation back when we were getting C and C++ would be the same. We didn't we did get something, we'd be in the same situation. Oh, so so is a, is a, what that implies is Someone hears about a conversation uh, that figures out that you could patent something that would lock it up, and therefore, if it became part of the standard, then there's a lawsuit. Well, yeah. well there's that, a lawsuit against all of them. Yeah, yeah. Is we that standardize that, that you must violate your patent. Yeah. <laughs> right? And my <laughs> patent is the for loop. Right? Uh oh. So I think it, it sounds absurd, but remember, like we're developing abstractions, and many of these abstractions are quite innovative. The other side, I will say, from anything I contribute to Promos, is Kronos's property, and they have a license to, to use it within the implementation without me collecting money. So I can't come in and say, I have a solution. And, uh, ding, 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 ding. Right. Trust me, I don't get paid for any of this. But that I can assure you. There is no licensing for any of the work I do. Um, the need for secrecy is unfortunately, I really feel that as a software developer, that I should do like a double major in law. Because it's not, I can write software, it's I can write software that doesn't violate the intellectual property of a single click, or the concept of using something to accelerate business, or business patterns. I don't understand these things. But I think that you know, any company is going to be wary of entering into any sort of non-protected kind of dialogue. Remember, I mean, if we're in a room here. Let's imagine that this is a kernel meeting. Just put on your thinking caps. And your company is suing that guy, and he's suing you, and you're like outside the room. Like it's you need to have that think type of protection where you can talk, you can come together, work together um, under a framework that there are going to be no consequences. Also, oh, that you can't be deposed on something said by someone else. So <laughs> I think that's the intention. I mean, again, I don't. I just know the length of my agreement. It's 35 pages. Mm. <laughs> I've never signed a 35-page NDA before in this one. Mm. Um, so I'm not a lawyer, but, but I, I don't understand. I mean, I would wish that things aren't that secret. And I'll say that the fact that it's a provisional release now is also a great thing. Mm. Because what it means is we're saying, well, we're not just coming to you with a tablet and saying, this is OpenCL 1.0, which happened, right? And oh, there's problems that maybe would have been resolved if we asked people. Mm. That's all disappeared now, because we're saying, well, here's a provisional standard. Whatever IP protection that had to happen, maybe it's already happened, I don't know. But now we can ask you for feedback, right? So intellectual property law is something that is very... I've met people who will say, you know, this is my multi-million dollar idea, and I came up with it while watching The Simpsons on like a pencil and paper. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
this so to speak. But I think that's a reason for the secrecy. I don't think there's any intention in this. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Any other questions before pizza? There is no pizza. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's a good time. I meant well keeps going into that. But. It's provisionally released pizza. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, let's take, take AJ again. Okay.